So um, thanks for uh, letting me talk here today. I'm from the group of uh, Björk Hammer uh, from Aarhus. And uh, I'd like to present my work on quantifying the concepts of exploration and exploitation towards designing a more intelligent global optimization methods. Let's uh, jump right into the, the task at hand. So in global structure optimization, we want to reach the global minimum structure here depicted as uh, the kinoline molecule. Um, and we want to do this in a vast configuration space with many other local minima structures. Um, and we want to also do it in, uh, by evaluating as few other uh, local minima structures in order to save computational resources. So imagine now that we have this scenario where we only know these four structures up here in this uh, energy funnel. Then it might seem like a good idea to try and uh, ex uh, use or perturb these structures in order to find the, the low energy structures at, uh, at the bottom of this energy uh, funnel here. And that's what we call the exploitation, and we investigate further a region known to have uh, low energy structures. Imagine now if we know a single structure all the way over here, then it might also. interesting task and also a well-known task to the global optimization community and also one that I know that Melitza has been working with the uh, with relation optimization method for, uh, for structure optimization. So our workhorse for the uh, global uh, optimization uh, search is the evolutionary algorithm that we have already covered. So in this uh, video here we see to the left our current candidate uh, structure and to the right we have the currently best candidate found in the search. So, as we see, we produce a lot of uh, local minima structures during the search and also reach a global minimum. And in many uh, standard global uh, structure optimization methods, uh, this data is not used for anything. It's basically a waste product. We only use the, the very uh, most stable structures that are in the population in order to evolve the search. So what we aim to do is to use uh, all of this data and also guide Enable, enable the evolutionary algorithm to, uh, to adapt its, its strategy based on the current state of the search space. And now this uh, particular search here found the global minimum after around 500 attempts. That gives rise to one data point in this plot here, which shows the number of successful runs as a function of the number of required uh, attempts or the number of local um, structure relaxations. And if we want some statistics, to probe how well our, uh, our algorithm performs, then we can restart this search 800 times, and then we can count all the uh, successful runs in, in a plot like this. And if we then sum up all the, the bars and the histogram here, we can instead visualize this as, as a cumulative success uh, from which we can read uh, that in this case, about 15% of our 800 restarts found the global minimum uh, after uh, 1,000 attempts. So basically, we, basically, we want this curve to to lie as, as high as possible for a high performance uh, search. So I want to present to you two approaches on how to enhance and how to balance this exploitation exploration problem. And the first one is a clustering approach, and the next one is the Bayesian framework. Let's we'll start with the, with the clustering approach. So imagine now that we're in the middle of a, a, a search, a in the middle of a structure search. So these are all the structures that we have currently found. Um, the most stable structures are in uh, what we call the population, so these are the structures that we uh, evolve into better structures. And if we then go ahead and, and perturb some of these structures or com combine them, as Björk also showed, then we can produce an offspring structure. In this case, the offspring structure is uh, stable enough that it can uh, enter the population. And we can even see, if we look at this structure, that it's a quite interesting structure, right, because it's, it's the only uh, uh, only structure with two rings out of all these structures, and it, it resembles quite well the global minimum, which has two six member of the rings. But the algorithm doesn't know that yet. So, in order for the algorithm to, to see that, we apply the clustering. So, when we apply the clustering, we group these structures into groups of geometrically similar structures. So, up here to the, to the right, we have, for instance, elongated structures. 
down here to, to, to the left, we have uh, structures with, with a single ring in, in geometry. And also, uh, the, with the clustering, uh, the algorithm can identify that this structure over here doesn't belong to any of the other uh, clusters. So it now marks an, an interesting structure in the, in the region of, uh, of the search space that we've not currently ex explored very well. So we've now forced the evolutionary algorithm to choose this structure as a parent for further production of, of new structures. Consider also another scenario where we, in the blue cluster over here, over here it has produced a lot of structures now. So it's now a dense region, a well-explored region, and, and it, it seems stupid to continue to probe this region over here. So with the clustering, we can now go ahead and penalize structures in this region so that they uh, sort of exit the population, and then we can make room for some other structures in order to sort of escape this uh, region of the search space. So the, it, it's, it's these two techniques that, that we will use uh, to try and enhance the search of the evolutionary algorithm. So implementing the clustering into the EA, it could look like this. So here we have the standard scheme. We generate the random starting structures. Uh, they made of the population. Uh, in this case, it's a, a fixed size population of five members, five structures. From the population, we draw parents. The parents with an either pair and mutate combined locally relax the, the offspring structure, and if the energy of that structure is, is low enough, or correspondingly, if the fitness uh, is high enough, then it can enter the population and be used for the production of new structures. So now, with the clustering, we can go and enhance this step over here, where we draw parents. So before, it was uh, done uh, randomly, meaning that it would waste a lot of time uh, on non-interesting non structures in the population. Uh, now we can instead go ahead and favor the outlier structures, which was this green structure on the previous slide. We can also go ahead and penalize structures in, uh, in large clusters. And then this, uh, every time we produce a new structure, we go ahead and recluster all the structures to update our cluster map in the configuration space. So let's take a look at, the, at some results now. So, these are again 800 restarts of our evolutionary algorithm. The blue curve here is the benchmark run, where we don't apply any of this clustering. Uh, and then the green curve is when we start favoring outliers in the population. So we force the algorithm to use outliers as parents whenever they're present in the population. So already now we see some uh, performance gain in the search. We can also go ahead and penalize structures uh, in large clusters, and we do this by adding some penalty term to the, to the fitness function. And we see that uh, there's a similar performance gain, but, but note that this is only after around uh, 600 attempts that, that this effect starts to kick in. And this is presumably when clusters have grown large enough that uh, structures start being penalized in, in those clusters. So in a way, it's a method for structures to, to escape or the search to escape a little bit more. We can, of course, also apply both of these techniques, and we see that an additive effect of the of both, the, uh, of both the techniques here. So that was a, that was a clustering approach to uh, enhancing the, the evolutionary algorithm. So next, uh, let's dive into this uh, Bayesian framework here. In the uh, Bayesian framework, we can uh, now instead predict an uncertainty for, for some points of the energy surface. Um, and had we, been work, had we been working with a low dimension problem, for instance, and, and had solved it on, on some surface with two translational and one rotational degree of freedom, we could simply go ahead and probe or, or set up the system at these high uh, uncertainty areas and then map out the entire potential energy surface easily. But since we were working with a very high dimensional system, then we have all the trans translational, translational degrees of freedom for all the atoms. We must simply go ahead and set up the system in these unknown points of energy surface. So what we want to do instead is to calculate an uncertainty for all of the known structures in the search. The way we do this is that we take a structure, say this one, and then we assume that we haven't known the structure and calculate what would the uncertainty have been at that given point in space. So see the structure here, I remove it, and now there's some uncertainty. Uh, and that, uh, that 
uncertainty we then assign to this structure that would have been uh, in this prime space. We can also do this for the structure over here to the far right. And now, as you see, the uncertainty becomes much larger because we don't have any nearby structures to help us estimate the, the energy in that region of the potential energy landscape. So let's return now to how we can use this in the evolutionary algorithm. Assume that, again, we have the five most stable structures in the, um, in the population. Uh, and then in this picture here, it would be uh, these five structures. And that doesn't seem like a, a very good idea because then we just keep probing the same structures in this uh, energy funnel here. If we instead now uh, adjust the fitness function similar to how we did it with the clustering approach, using this uncertainty uh, sigma and some tunable parameter kappa, we can then uh, adjust the fitness. And I'll just illustrate it for these two points here for, for, for clarity. We can adjust the fitness and allow this structure over here to enter the population because it has a, a high uncertainty. So basically, we start to, to favor uncertain structures, or we start to increase the tendency to explore the, uh, the energy landscape. So now we can use this structure in an attempt to escape this energy function. That's the, um, that's the thought behind the, the Bayesian approach. And the model that we use to predict this uncertainty is a, a standard uh, Gaussian process, as we, we've had the presented in the first session of today, where we use a, a Gaussian kernel in order to predict the variance of this Gaussian distribution corresponding to, to our structures. And it's then this variant that we use as our uncertainty estimate for each of our structures. So if we again now uh, take a look at some results, then now we're looking for this uh, natto uh, genome uh, structure. Um, then for kappa equal to zero, we have the, the default evolutionary algorithm uh, without any uh, uh, correction term here. So this is the this is our benchmark search where we find the global minimum in around 40% of the runs after uh, 1,000 attempts. If we then start increasing kappa to higher values meaning that we start favoring uncertain structures, we see a, a quite significant performance gain in the search. If we increase kappa further, so to kappa equal to 6, 8, and 10, we see a drop in performance. So these high kappa values, uh, with these high, high kappa values, we start to explore the energy landscape too much and, and waste uh, the resources in that regard. We can even also, uh, I mean, we can even choose a negative value for kappa, meaning that we start to penalize uncertain structures. And uh, based on this, that's certainly, certainly uh, not a, a good idea as well. So if we now plug the final success rate after 1,000 attempts uh, for all of these uh, kappa values, we can illustrate it in a plot like this, where it's very clear that we have an optimal uh, kappa value corresponding to, co uh, corresponding to an optimal balance between exploitation and exploration in our search method. So this is sort of like a quantification of these two, uh, of a way of, of controlling these two uh, concepts in the search. We can also go ahead and make some, uh, some interesting analysis uh, with respect to the population of our, of our evolutionary algorithm. So here I've plotted the average population energy uh, against the population diversity, uh, which is uh, basically the average uh, distance between all structures in the population uh, normalized to, to a unity scale. So what we can see here is that we start up here with the initial population, and then down towards 1,000 attempts, we, uh, the, the energy of the population increases, and also the diversity uh, decreases. And this is for kappa equal to zero. So we can map this out for the other kappa values as well. So for kappa equal to 2, uh, we see that it, it reaches about the same or perhaps even lower energy, uh, but we maintain a more diverse population. And if we plot it for, for all the kappa values, now, then now we can again identify these optimal kappa values down uh, in the bottom here. So kappa equal to 2 and 4, those are the values, or those are the optimal balances that uh, where the population reached the the lowest energies at some population diversity. So if we have a, a negative kappa value, 
that we tend to exploit too much. So the, the search essentially dives into the first energy funnel that it finds and gets stuck there. Whereas if we have a, a very high Kappa values, we spend too much time uh, perturbing the structures in very far regions of the configuration space. So it's about finding this optimal balance here. We've also uh, tested this on, on a few other systems. So this is the after kinone, this is kinoli, some other um, organic system here. And we, we do see this optimal value or this optimal balance between exploitation and exploration in all these cases. We've also tried it on this uh, rich titanium dioxide, rich uh, surface reconstruction. And uh, we do see an, an optimal value, even though it's not as pronounced and we hypothesize that this is because in, in that case we have template of fixed surface atoms onto which the other atoms can sort of attach. So, so by having this template, the need for, for balancing exploration and exploitation is, is probably not as, as great as in these other three, uh, three standard cases. So I've now presented these two approaches, clustering and uh, debation approach. So which one would, would we prefer? So I think the, the clustering uh, approach is a somewhat more complex since it involves both this uh, count concern and also the fact that we need to sort of somewhat artificially force the, the, the method to, to pick out the out outliers whenever they're present in the population. And that also introduces um, a lot of uh, parameters first to, to carry out the clustering, then also to determine the shape of this penalty function that we use to penalize structures in, in large clusters. Whereas in the Bayesian approach, we only have this single a tunable parameter that we can go ahead and, and use for directly controlling uh, the balance between exploitation and exploration. And also, in the innovation approach, we can uniquely assign an uncertainty to each structure, whereas in the, in the clustering approach, we treat every structure in a single cluster uh, the same, no matter where they are in the cluster. So that's sort of a, a, a discreteness of that method that, that, that I really uh, liked. <laughs> So I think the, the Bayesian approach here is the, is the, um, is the better one of the two. And with that, um, that was all I, all I had to present to you. So I'd like to thank uh, the entire group yeah. of Biakama and also uh, the Bilo Foundation for financially supporting this, this research. And then um, I'll take any questions. of finding organic molecules basically from scratch with you. And um, you focused on finding what you call a global minimum, so one molecule that you want to find. Yeah. Uh, but there might be also other molecules with the same composition, which are very close in energy. How, how do you do with these local? I mean, it's true that this approach here is, is for finding global uh, minimum structures. We've also used the, um, perhaps, I can, perhaps I can find that here, we've also used the clustering approach to sort of try and see, to sort of try and look at the entire configuration space and not only the, um, the global minimum structure. So here it is. This is now if we if we cluster five thousand structures, and then we can go ahead and look at um, some more interesting um, things in the entire configuration space. So the global minimum is, is in this cluster here the dark blue cluster, and we can look at all the other structures in this dark blue cluster and see how they resemble the, the global minimum structure. And in that way, sort of analyze the, the entire configuration space to, to look for the structures. I was just thinking how in organic chemistry undergrad, they force you to like draw all the isomers of yeah, yeah, yeah. Eight, so yeah, 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 so it's, it's true, yeah. And there was a question over here. Yes, please. Okay, so as I understood, the main idea is to analyze the structure from the generation, right? Yeah, to penalize structure from the... So uh, how do you decide like, how many structures should be penalized? So how do you decide that the structure is that? Um, so so the, the penalty, you mean in the clustering approach, so the, the penalty is based on on some uh, functional, <coughs> it has some functional expression here. So I, I showed it just very briefly up here. So basically, a, a structure receives a penalty based on the size of the cluster that it belongs to. Okay, so can we solve that like half of the generation of the 
depend on us. Third, can be sold as half of the generation basically should depend on us. Half of the generation should. For example, you have to structures and generations, and based on the criteria of 10 generations, 10 structures are that and they should depend on us. Can be ah, yeah, but I, it might be because we're not working with the concept of generations. Okay. So we're working with a fixed size population, which, which we just, just keeps evolving. So we don't evolve it for some time, or multiple populations for some time, and then use that as a generation to, to make up a new population. So we only work with a single uh, population, I think contrary to what you do in the, in the boost back uh, code. Okay. Okay, we can discuss it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So I had, a, on this point, I had a similar question on, on when you apply this uh, Bayesian criteria to <coughs> the, the uncertainty. You still do your mutations and the, the mating part, right? Yeah. And then that those are your new structures and, and you evaluate their uncertainty basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yes, then, so. then you out, out of that pool do you keep the, the ones that you don't want, do you keep them out? And how do you maintain a stable population? Yes, yeah, so, so so the population is is always in this case uh, a size of, of the five highest fit members. Okay. Um, so if a if a structure so if, if this down here are the, the most fit structures, and we have a structure up here that is then very uncertain, then it can get a sort of a, a benefit from that from that uh, correction term that allows it to get a high fitness so that it can enter the population. Then if it enters the population, then the, the, the population sort of shifts so that the, the six to most uh, highest fitness structure would have to leave the population. Sebastian. Yeah. Uh, um, just for my interest, uh, what, how do you cluster? So what is so yeah, yeah. that? So we use uh, hierarchical agglomerative clustering. So uh, and we do that because we don't have to decide on the number of, of, of clusters as you have to do with the k-means, uh, for instance. And you have to decide on the number of clusters. But in our case, we want that to evolve naturally from the search, right? So initially, we have just 20 random structures. So we have one uh, entire cluster, and then as we, as we Continue the search and find all, the, all, all of these energy forms, and we want a method that can automatically determine the number of clusters yeah, from the state of the search. Yeah. And that's, that's, that can be done with the array cluster. Yeah, um, you very nicely found this global minimum uh, for this chemical composition, uh, but you also have all these crazy intermediates. So, how do you make sure that you have? reliable energetics to assess their stability. I mean, there must be crazy open shell cases that are even hard to converge with electronic structure calculations and stuff. Yeah, um, that's true. I mean, that's a, that's, that's a, a, a deficit <laughs> in this. I mean, we, we use a DFTB for the statistics here, and in, a, in an application, we would use a DFT. So, so we're sort of limited by, by the accuracy of those methods. I mean, here for sure, your target molecule is much more stable, but there might be other cases where it's not so clear. Yeah, yeah it could be, yeah. yeah. One last question. Um, so we're talking about population size 20. Uh, five. In five. Yeah, at least uh, 20 in the clustering approach, and I think we chose five. That's quite tiny for... It is, it is, but, but indeed, and, and I think, um, and also without the patient uh, correction, it, it would be more beneficial. We've actually showed that it would be more beneficial to have a larger population. But because of this sort of dynamic uh, correction based on the uncertainty, we allow uh, structures to enter and exit the population more rapidly because of this uncertainty criteria. So then we can actually do with a smaller population to focus the search. And then only when we have a very uh, uncertain structure that can enter the population, be used, and then exit again. So it's a way to sort of Focus the exploitation of the search uh, at the same time as we want to I mean, have this criteria of exploration. Do you think that if you would go to bigger molecules, you would necessarily need a bigger population as well? Could be. <coughs> That's an interesting question. I haven't identified this, but one could imagine that the need for, for more exploration would, would rise because the configuration space is, is much larger. You could easily be the one leader that you Very quick question. Could it be useful to change dynamically the escape factor as you are quenching? Yes, yes, definitely. So I really like at some point that one could 
this this couple value obviously we will have to choose right now. So so if one could somehow estimate from the state of the search what this couple value should be, because it could be that it's it's a somewhat system dependent or whatever. So if one could dynamically choose it during the search, that would be yeah, extremely useful. Okay. So time's up. So let's thank our speaker again.